There are two ways of looking at consciousness. One is from the outside. We look at other people, other beings, and their consciousness seems to be dependent on their bodies. In this view, the body comes first and consciousness comes after. And if you want to make a change in consciousness, it has to come from a change in the body. The other way of looking at consciousness is to look at it from the inside. In other words, you're here, conscious. And your awareness comes first here, awareness of the body then comes after. And as we try to make changes in our consciousness, we realize that Although some things may come in from outside, a lot of the changes come from within. It's the second point of view that the Buddha is operating from. You don't solve the problems of consciousness by changing the chemicals of the body. You ch solve the problems by understanding consciousness from inside. What your intentions are, what your perceptions are, how you can change these things. The questions you ask, all of this is consciousness changing itself from within. In this case, consciousness is prior. If it weren't meditation, it wouldn't be doing anything at all. But it is doing something that's changing our minds. And as the Buddha said, at the end of life, the body no longer provides a place for consciousness to stay focused. It can go on. Craving is its bridge to another body. And of course, craving depends on consciousness. Consciousness depends on craving. The two of them, as long as they keep going together, can keep each other going indefinitely. And the currents of consciousness can go outside the body. They can do things that a normal materialist wouldn't imagine. This is one of the things you learn as you practice. There's more to the mind than just looking at the outside would tell you. Several years back I gave a Dharma talk at a meditation center. Talked about karma and during the Q&A it got into issues of rebirth. The following week, the teacher at the center decided he had to do damage control. And so he explained that poor Tan Jeff went to Thailand when he was young and impressionable and picked up a lot of things over there. He didn't sort out what was the difference between true Dharma and Thai culture. And I've always felt the fact that I was there from an early age was not a handicap. It was being there and being around the Ajans and other people practicing meditation began to realize there's more to the mind than. Our Western materialist ideas can, can account for. And one of the things about the mind is this notion of the current of the mind. When the mind is really concentrated, you send currents out to other people. And if they're sensitive, they can pick them up. There was one evening when I was meditating and I was thinking about one of the supporters of the temple. She was going through a bad time. And so I sent some metta in her direction. The next day she came to the monastery and she said, Did you send metta to me last night? She felt it. And she knew where it came from. So these aspects of consciousness that are possibilities, at the very least leave your mind open to their possibilities. And of course, because consciousness doesn't end with the death of the body. That means there is also the possibility of sending the current of your goodwill to people who have passed away. A Brahmin once went to the Buddha and asked him about this tradition that the Brahmins had of making merit for their dead ancestors. And he said, do they get it? And the Buddha said, well, if they're in a position where it's possible for the merit to go to them, they will. And that possible position was the realm of the hungry ghosts. Now this can be looked at as somewhat as an insult to the Brahmins. They called their ancestors Beta, which originally meant father. 
you know, the Buddha was talking about, when he talked about bad thought, he was talking about hungry ghosts, these beings that, after they've died, just kind of wander around hungry with very little source of food aside from the merit that's dedicated to them. And Brahman then asks, well, what if I don't have any ancestors who are hungry ghosts? And the Buddha says, everybody has ancestors who are hungry ghosts. So think about that. When you're meditating here, you're making merit and you can share it. The act of sharing is a meritorious act in and of itself. It sort of gives you compound interest on top of the, the good that you've done. And the question, of course, is how can something that you've done have an impact on somebody else? Well, they have to appreciate it. They have to be in a position where they can receive it and then feel some appreciation for the goodness you've sent in their direction. The hungry ghosts tend to be sensitive to this, which is why they're in a position where they can receive this. When I first went to town and first went to Medijan Fu, and it was shortly after my mother had passed away, and that was one of the first things he taught me. Every night after your meditation, dedicate the med merit of your meditation to your mother. And of course, then expands out. They talk a lot about making merit and dedicating to the people to whom you have karmic debts, people who have been good to you, people who deserve your gratitude. And it's a good exercise to sit down and make a list. Who are the people who have taught you things? Who are the people who have gone out of their way for you? Relatives or not relatives? Then dedicate your merit to them. It expands your mind and it sends good currents out. And whether you can follow the currents or not, it's always a good attitude to say, I'm just going to spread it out regardless. Because there are some hungry ghosts that are receptive and others are not. I think I've told you the story about Maha Kwan. He was a monk at Wamakut. And it turned out he was very deeply into the Buddha image business. People would come from different parts of Thailand with Buddha images or parts of Buddha images, heads, hands, whatnot. And they come around 2, 3, 4 a.m. No questions were asked as to where they got these things. If it was a head, no question was asked, did you cut off the head someplace? Mahakwan had money in his drawer. People could take the money and then he had arrangements that I don't know exactly how many intermediaries there were, but eventually these Buddha images and parts of Buddha images would get onto the international art market. So who knows, when you go into a house here in America and maybe a Buddha head is on the coffee table or a hand or something, may have gone through Mahakwan. So he was off in an isolated part of the monastery. There were no other monks living nearby. When Ajahn Fuang was invited to go to the monastery there at Wampakut to teach meditation, they arranged for him to live in the second story of the building in which Mahakwan was living in the first story. He didn't like having some, anyone else there, especially with Ajahn Fuang being a meditation monk. Who knows, he might be up meditating at 2, 3, 4 a.m. He did everything he could to get rid of Ajahn Fuang. John Fung stayed on for three years and then was invited out to Wat Damasatit. Shortly after he left Wat Makut, Mahakwan was found stabbed to death. And then nobody would live in the building after his death. A couple years later, John Fung was invited back to Wat Makut to teach meditation and found himself back in the second story of that same building. And as he was teaching meditation, every now and then one of his students would report a vision. There's this bloody monk wandering around the building. They had no idea. They hadn't heard the story about Mahakwan. They didn't know anything about it. And John Fung would always say, well, dedicate the merit to him, the merit of your meditation. So they'd sit in for a few minutes, and the answer would always come back, he wouldn't take it. Some grudges get carried past the grave. It's just not the case that all hungry ghosts are receptive. But given that we all have dead relatives or dead friends who are probably hungry ghosts, it's good to dedicate our merit to them. There's always the possibility it could give them the nourishment they need. 
their stories, and then I reported in awareness itself. And John Fung had a student who was suddenly found herself seeing a lot of hungry ghosts in her meditation. I think it was kind of a Dharma inspiration for this, because she herself, prior to that, had been practicing magic. She insisted it was white magic, but you never know. And people who practice magic tend to believe that the doctrine of karma doesn't apply to them. So all of a sudden, as she was meditating and saw all these people who were suffering from having done this, that, or the other thing, there was a good lesson in karma for her. When she first started seeing these things, she didn't want it to happen. She asked John Fung how she could become unsensitive, insensitive to these things. He said there's good lessons to learn and also good things you can do for them. So he told her, whenever you see a hungry ghost, first ask it what it did to put itself in that position. Then dedicate the merit of your meditation to them, in case they might be in a position to receive it and benefit from it. So she found that she, when she would ask these questions, they were very honest in saying, I did this, did that. But she also found that after dedicating the merit of her meditation to them, some of them would actually change from their status as a hungry ghost to something much better, and others would not. They're not yet ready. This is why, as I said this afternoon, there's no expiry date on how long you can dedicate merit to somebody and there's no long, or how long they've been dead. There doesn't come a point where they can't receive it anymore. If they're in a position where their karma allows it, when they're sensitive to it and they're appreciative, okay, the merit does go to them, because they make merit in their appreciation. So remember that the ways of consciousness are a lot more subtle. There are more possibilities than our normal Western upbringing would allow for. It also helps to remember that we're here in a large fabric of interconnected people, people we've been dependent on, people we've benefited from. Now we're in a position to benefit them. That attitude is a willingness to benefit. It's an important nourishment for your own concentration. This is why dedicating merit is good for you, too. It broadens your mind. It makes you more appreciative of the goodness that we've received and of our possibility to pass that goodness on. And it gives further motivation to put more effort into the practice. Sometimes you say, well, that's enough for me tonight. But then you can ask yourself, is this enough for all the people I'd like to help? Push things a little further. So you have enough goodness not only for yourself, but enough goodness to pass around.